Okay, now that we've gotten our feet wet with basic trigonometric identities and simplifying expressions in section 5.1 and 5.2, here in section 5.3, we want to prove trigonometric identities, which might actually turn out to be a bit easier because now we're going to have a target or a right-hand side that we are trying to get to using some strategies and identities that we have learned. And so I'm going to start off just by giving you a list of seven, eight, maybe nine strategies to use whenever you are trying to prove a trig identity. And so the first strategy that I can give you is that you always want to start with the longer or more complicated side and try to work your way to the shorter or less complicated side. And the way that's going to work out for us is that most of the time that's going to mean we're going to start on the left hand side and try to transform that using identities and algebraic techniques to look like the right hand side. The second strategy is that you always want to keep your target in mind, meaning what do I want the final answer to look like? that can influence your strategies and what you do in uh, attempting to prove the identity. So you want to always make sure that you're keeping in mind what that right hand side is and trying to think of what steps you'll need to take in order to get there. The third strategy that I can give you is to always keep your fundamental identities in mind. And so you might see in there a Pythagorean identity that you can use right off the bat to try and simplify things. Or you might be able to use a quotient identity or reciprocal identity to try and simplify. And so always keep those fundamental identities close and make sure you're on the lookout for when you can use them. Number four is a least common denominator. And remember, this was a strategy that we used whenever we had fractions. And so if we wanted to add or subtract two fractions, one of the strategies that we used in section 5, 1, and 5, 2 was the strategy of finding a common denominator. And so always think of that whenever you have two fractions. Fifth is factoring. And so you might have a problem where factoring really helps you. And so for example, we had this in the previous notes where we had tangent x times sine squared x plus tangent x times cosine squared x. And since both terms have a tangent, we were able to factor out a tangent x and that left, was, left us with sine squared x plus cosine squared x, which then leads to a Pythagorean identity being left in the parentheses. And so this is just tangent x times one. But if you don't know to factor, you'll never get there. And so don't forget about the possibility of factoring. Number six is what I call peeling, and we also discussed peeling in the previous section. Peeling was whenever we had something like one over sine x cosine x with multiplication going on in the denominator. We could write this as one over sine x multiplied by one over cosine x, which would become using identities cosecant x times secant x. So again, what you're doing there is you're peeling and making that a fraction and then coming in behind that and coming with this to be a fraction. But again, that only happens whenever you are multiplying in the denominator. If you have plus or minus in the denominator, this cannot be done. Okay, strategy number seven is called splitting through the numerator. And so I'm going to explain this through a numerical example, let's say that I had something like 3 plus 2 divided by 7. This could be written as 3 divided by 7 plus 2 divided by 7. And we would call that splitting through the numerator. It's whenever we have addition or subtraction going on in the numerator. Now remember that we cannot split a fraction through the denominator. So if I had 7 divided by 3 plus 2, I could not write this as 7 thirds divided by 7 halves. Those two things are not equal. But it can be done as long as you're splitting through the numerator. And sometimes that's going to lead to really fast solutions to the proof, as we're going to see in the last example of these notes. 
Strategy eight is trig conjugates. This is going to involve usually whenever you have a one or a negative one involved. And so, for example, what I mean by that is let's say that we have a one plus sine x somewhere in the uh, numerator or denominator possibly of a fraction. Well, if I multiply that by its conjugate, that's going to give me one minus sine x. That would be the conjugate. And when I multiply those, those are now a difference of squares. And so this is going to be one minus sine squared of x, which using a Pythagorean identity, which a lot of the times will show up whenever you work with trig conjugates, you're going to get cosine squared of x. And so this is one way that a trig conjugate could be used is if you have a one plus sine x or a one minus sine x or a one plus cosine x or something to that effect. And then the last strategy, sort of the if all else fails or a last ditch effort strategy is to just try to rewrite everything in terms of sine and cosine and go from there to see if you can get to your target. Now, a couple of things, make sure that whenever you're doing these proofs that your work is very neat and clear and that I am able to follow it or so that anyone is able to follow it exactly the way you mean it. So remember, you might be able to see what's going on in your work because you skipped a step and you understand how you got from one line to the next. But if someone else reading your paper does not understand how you got from one line to the next, or it's not clear because your handwriting is not uh, neat and your work is sort of all over the place, then that's not going to be a good situation. We want work that is neat, in order, easy to read, and followable, because a lot of this, in fact, really 100% of this, is based on what your work looks like. I'm gonna be telling you what the answer is. Your work, so to speak, or your answer, I should say, your answer is going to be your work. And so that's gotta be in a nice, neat, and easy to read format. Okay, in example one, I'm gonna start you off with an algebraic identity proof, meaning there's not gonna be any trig involved in this proof, but we are going to still use some of the strategies that we have discussed. And so the first thing I notice here is that the left-hand side is definitely the side that I wanna start on because it is the more complicated side. I wanna show that the left-hand side is equal to two. Now, the second thing I notice is that I have fractions. And I know that one of my strategies is to find a common denominator whenever I have fractions, but that's not going to be the best way forward here. Now, why do I even mention that? I mention it because sometimes you're gonna try something and it's going to lead you into a brick wall and you're going to get stuck and confused and not really understand where to move forward from where you are. And in that particular case, when that happens to you, you need to be able to say, okay, I ran into a brick wall, I need to erase and start over. And so if you were to try to find a common denominator here, you would run into a brick wall, it would really end up being very messy, very convoluted, you would not see a way forward, and then what you would come next to then is hopefully factoring. And so if you look at the numerator, x squared minus one for both of these fractions, that factors as a difference of squares. And so for both of these fractions, I'm going to take that numerator and factor it into x plus one and x minus one. And what that's going to lead to then is a cancellation in both fractions. And so in the first fraction, I see that x minus one is going to cancel. And in the second fraction, I see that x plus one is going to cancel. And so now this is going to equal to x plus one minus parentheses x minus one. And so distributing that negative to that parentheses is gonna give me x plus one minus x plus one. And that means I'm going to end up with two after collecting the like terms, which means that the x's are going to cancel since one is positive and one's negative, and then positive one and positive one is going to give me two. And so I factored the numerators, I canceled with the denominators, and then I just collected the like terms, and that ended up giving me the right-hand side.